So, up next, we have got a fireside chat on deep tech in Europe. Pioneer's co-founder, Jürgen Furian, will discuss the technologies that are going to keep our cities functioning in the future in the background with partner at Atomico, Siraz Kalik. All right, so today we're going to talk about uh, European deep tech, the state of European deep tech. But before we dive into the topic, we would like to uh, you know, get some info about your background, uh, where you're coming from, and uh, give me the news. How did you come about to meet uh, Sergey Brin? I want to know that story. Yeah, so um, I'm a, a computer scientist by training, a, a European. I grew up here and a bit of uh, time in Pakistan, where my dad is from. And um, my background was I, I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I think since I saw Bill Gates on the cover of Time magazine in 1994, and I met Sergey Brin, who um, was a couple of years before me at Stanford. He was interested in some of the stuff I was doing at my research group. Uh, so I worked with a professor doing distributed computing. That was my, my area of expertise, which was very um, relevant, very, very good timing, because the future became all about parallel distributed computing. Um, so Sergey said, you know, Sergey's originally Russian, kind of when he was 10 and 11, moved to the US. So he still got a bit of a Russian accent. So he kind of said, you know, Siraj, how would you like to work for Google in this, in this slight Russian twinge? I thought, OK, yeah, this sounds interesting. Um, how how um, many people were working there at that moment? Uh, it was getting on 200, which, you know. Uh, Pretty early. Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, so, so, so talking about the company that you started in uh, 2006, I, I think, yeah, yeah. pioneering the, the use of, of machine learning to help farmers optimize their crop yield. And then a couple of years later, it was, it was acquired, uh, bought by Monsanto. So let me give me some insights. What, were your, what was your thinking process? Yeah, that's a pertinent question, um, right? Uh, Monsanto doesn't have the best of images. So um, when we started the company in 06, so this was a seven-year journey for us. You know, we built it from 06 on to 2013. It was acquired for, I think, 1.1 billion or something. This, this was a, a very uh, careful process, right? And up until maybe a, a year or two before we, we sold, we didn't even know if the business was going to be successful. So we really had to try a bunch of things. Um, but we didn't start the company with the idea that, oh, you know, we're going to be acquired by a big ag tech giant. Uh, in fact, I would say it feels pretentious to call myself a pioneer, but I would say our company is definitely a pioneer in that we started it on its journey of precision agriculture. We were the first company to have success in that space. And our idea was we were a couple of tech guys. We thought, can we apply machine learning and some of these so-called big data techniques to the biggest problem in the world, which is the weather and its impact on various industries, and the biggest industry is agriculture. One part of your question was, why did we sell, right? And um, it was clear that to execute where we wanted to be, our mission was to uh, make farming more efficient. Um, would require more capital, and quite a lot more capital over time, because farmers are pretty slow to adopt new technologies. So for us, you know, it was, from a risk-reward perspective, it made sense. Uh, and this was 2013. I would like to talk a little bit about Atomico. I mean, you are running a huge back office. It can be considered a platform VC, like similar to what Andreessen Horowitz is doing in, in, in the US. So a huge back office with people for, you know, with expertise in different areas. Um, how does that actually work? I mean, do you charge your st the startups that you invest in, do you charge them an extra amount because they get some extra stuff from Atomico? Is it a work for equity uh, model or is it just an additional thing that they only get with Atomico? And then the second question would be, if it's the last thing, how does it, to talking about fund economics, you have, you, you're ramping up the costs. Is the, and the, the value add that you give to the startups, is that big enough to, to compensate for, for the additional Justified. costs? Justified. Um, yeah, so um, Atomico invested in my seed round at Climate Corporation in 2007, right? the year after Atomico was founded. And um, uh, it was started by Nicholas Zenstrom, who is the founder of Skype. And this gives you a bit of a clue as to how we, we came to this model. So I joined a year and a half ago as an investment partner. And the reason I did, did that was because, in my opinion, I'd seen some really good VCs on my own company's board. Uh, I could contrast Atomico with you know, people from Index Ventures, NEA, you know, Google Ventures, Kosla, Founders Fund. They all came in at subsequent rounds. And the common theme I saw in my own board was the people who were ex-founders were better uh, and, and more relevant with their thoughts than, uh, than people who were not. So that, to me, was, uh, was a key thing, an insight as to what a VC should be about. Mm. And um, 
this is why Atomico was founded and why I decided it would make sense for me to align my journey with Atomico. Um, so the, the, the core idea is that great founders these days expect more than money. Good companies can get money. It's not about that. It's about something beyond that. And uh, in order to really achieve these great outcomes, you have to have the kind of support that comes from people who've done that, who are able to you know, uh, help you avoid certain mistakes. And you know, if you're good, you'll still get access to some of those people. But getting access to them on an ongoing, committed basis, that's actually uh, not that straightforward. Um, scaling a company is very hard. Mm. Uh, if it were easy, then more people would be able to do it. Um, so this was the core idea behind Atomico, is you know, founders helping founders and assemble a group of people that can really help companies scale. But, but, but by doing so, you're ramping up costs, right? So there's fund yeah. economics. So how do you compensate for that? I mean, how, how does that model work? Well, uh, if, you, uh, if you look at it uh, from a different angle, so first of all, the, the, the biggest thing that drives success in VC is picking the winners. It's, uh, and, and not just picking the winners, that seems like a passive act. It's helping enable amazing pioneer founders to become global category winners. So if you look at it in that term, you know, your top line is so different, so much higher, that expenses don't really matter as much. Mm. And no, we don't charge for this. It's part of the platform. Um, but there, there's a reason I for mean, that. it pays off. At, Completely. At, yeah. yeah, if you look at the, um, the journey of a company in statistical terms, if you think of it as a, you know, a curve upwards you know, in value with some error bars around that, um, I like to think of it as you know we're shifting that curve upwards, you know, in terms of your value, and we're decreasing the error bars, and that you can't put a price on that. You can't say this is worth 10 percent. You know, uh, any good idea these days has many startups trying to tackle it, and the difference between a little bit of better execution can be, uh, you know, you become the winner or you become second sure. and third, uh, which is worth a lot less. So, I just um, see that the time is running so yeah, yeah. fast. It's yeah, incredible. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's go directly into uh, deep tech. Awesome. Yeah. Before we talk about deep tech, what's your definition of deep tech? Uh, deep tech is a very vague term. Um, yeah. It means different things to different people. But it, I, I think it's actually a kind of cool term, because it captures something uh, about pioneers, actually, about pushing the limits of technology to enable problems to be solved that previously were you know, considered nothing to do with computers, right? So um, there's a few things that, in our view, so, uh, were, were part of that. One is obviously this huge um, impact of machine learning and, and AI, which is a, sometimes a bit of an abused term. But generally, the idea of using machines to do things that you can't program them to do. They have to learn themselves based on many examples. Mm. Uh, that's huge. And we've seen uh, many examples of this. I'm sure there will be people talking about this in great detail today. Um, the the second thing is obviously VR and AR, which start to blend uh, you know, uh, the real world with computers. So you don't have to sit in front of a screen or stroke a piece of glass anymore. Um, there's, uh, uh, there, there's a number of uh, other core areas of so algorithmic innovation. So companies that are doing things um, like uh, improbable you know, mm -hmm. uh, with spatial OS, simulating real worlds, but anything with core innovation. And of course, IoT um, is another of those key areas. How are we able to compete with the US, with China, if the deciding factor for such cool projects is money? Um, fortunately, it's not just the deciding factor, um, but it is important, as you said. Um, but that gap is actually closing. Even though that gap for later stage funding was something like 10x uh, between Europe and the US, um, we started to see some really encouraging signs. Uh, one of the things we, um, we mentioned was if only 0.6% of pension fund money in Europe is put into uh, startups, early stage ventures, it totally closes that gap. But when is that starting? It's starting. So if you look at Klarna or uh, you look at uh, uh, SoundCloud, like some of these companies, um, some, uh, Spotify, I believe, as well, um, European pension funds are actually participating in their, have participated in the last round. So it's starting to happen. Uh, but also, China is really interested in funding European companies. So you know, the success can stay here, even if the dollars come from somewhere else. Money follows talent, and that talent is spread across Europe, which is a really strong thing. It's, it shows the resilience. Just very quickly, three to four years from now, where do you want to invest? What are you really excited about? Um, so uh, partly, I think, uh, just because of the, the huge impact it can have, uh, I have to say AI. Um, 
you know, up until this point, we had these revolutions like, you know, better communications or, you know, uh, computers existing, cloud computing. But these were all you know, improvements in modality. But AI is, is a new revolution. It changes what, uh, what machines can do, right? And we're starting off with, with simpler things, uh, but this starts to become really meaningful, where computers can be better than the best humans. You know, we saw that in Go with DeepMind's mm -hmm. win uh, against the world champion last year. But imagine that for radiology, for, uh, you know, uh, we, w we were trying to do that with agriculture, and that's been proving to work. Um, imagine that in autonomous cars, you know, where you have millions of fewer fatalities a year um, because, you know, humans are out of the loop. Uh, these are just we fundamental. just accepted them because we have to go from A to B. Yeah, we accepted yeah exactly. It. It, it, they're fundamental changes, and AI is at the center of it all. Mm -hmm.